Welcome to New Life Assembly of God's Media Ministry. We are glad that you are here. We believe the Word of God is relevant and life-changing, and hope that you will be blessed by this message. If you'll take your scriptures in hand and turn with me to Song of Solomon chapter 3, and we're going to continue our series, Sex, Love, and God. Now, next week, you want to be sure to come out because we're doing a message titled, How to Have Great Sex. Don't look at me like that. God invented sex. Amen. Now, parents, if you have teens, don't worry. It's going to be PG, all right? And we're not going to get risque. We're in the house of the Lord. But we're going to talk about it. Amen. We're going to talk about God's principles. Amen. For uh, the blessing that he desires married couples to enjoy. So be sure to be back with us next week week for that message. Amen. So that's just kind of to prime the pump and get your interest going so that you'll be sure to be back. This morning's message is titled, Why Your Wedding Matters to God. And notice I placed the wedding before the message on sex. Hallelujah. Amen. There is an order to everything. Praise God. All right. I didn't hear a loud enough amen on that, but that's okay. Amen, pastor. That's what the Bible preaches. Praise God. All right. Why Your Wedding Matters to God. I read uh, uh, an article by David Lapp uh, titled, A Meaningless Piece of Paper That Makes a Difference. And he shared some conversations that he had with a 31-year-old man named Rodney, who had been with the mother of his four-year-old son for 12 years. And although he said that he and his girlfriend, Cammy eventually wanted to marry, they had not yet even become engaged because it just wasn't important enough to make it a top priority. For him, he said, when it comes to being with somebody, it's about a relationship that you have. Rodney said, I can say I'm with Cammy all day long. People know that. I can smile at her. She smiles back. That's all we need. I don't know, need rings or a piece of paper to say that we're together. Honestly, he said, marriage is basically just a commitment between the two people. The commitment's the same whether you're married or not, whether you have that piece of paper or not. That's what he's saying. When Lapp asked Rodney if he thought there was a difference between marriage and living together, he didn't hesitate. He said, oh, yes, yes, definitely. I live with Cammy, but I do my own thing. She does her own thing. When you're married, decisions have to be made together. When you're not married... I can make the decision to get up and leave if I want. If I'm married, I got to make decisions with my wife on when we can leave, when we can come back, how much money we can spend, how much we can't. He said, when you're married, things have to be pulled together. When we're not married, my money's my money and her money's her money. We do this, we do that. I buy this this time, next time she buys it and so on and so forth. So while Rodney didn't necessarily believe that he needed to get married because they had a so-called commitment anyway, which I don't understand what kind of commitment it is if he said he can get up and leave at any time, but he said they had a commitment, but he insisted that even though, quote unquote, they had a commitment, that there was a difference between marriage and just living together, that marriage does make a difference. And marriage does indeed make a difference. Despite an increasing attitude in society that marriage is just a meaningless piece of paper, marriage is God's idea. Marriage is not a human institution. People didn't invent it. It's not something that people dreamed up. It's not a cultural invention. It's not something society came up with. God created marriage and it's not just a piece of paper. Christian marriage is a covenant between one man and one woman and God. There's three people in this covenant, one man, one woman, and God. And it must be recognized by the law and before witnesses of their community of friends and family. That's why the message of Song and Solomon is so important today, because it tells the love story of a couple, Solomon and a poor Shulamite woman, depicted as the lover and the beloved. And it is a relationship that grows and culminates in their marriage and their mutual delight in each other. God has given us an entire book on love, marriage, and sex. 
because he invented marriage to be one of the greatest blessings experienced between a man and a woman. And he wants to help his people get it right so that they can enjoy the blessing of a true and lasting lifelong covenant love and so that they can be a testimony to the world of what is possible when a relationship has been consecrated to God Amen. when we do it God's way Amen. now this message is for everybody it's for those who have already been, been married it's all, already married it's for those who hope one day to be married it's for those who care about some people who are married maybe a son a daughter grandson granddaughter niece nephew so that you can be equipped with biblical wisdom to help them so there's something in this uh, message for everybody amen but read with me if you will song of solomon chapter 3 we're going to read for now verses 6 through 11 the scripture says who is this sweeping in from the deserts like a cloud of smoke along the ground smelling of myrrh and frankincense and every other spice that can be bought look it is the chariot of solomon with 60 of the mightiest men of his army surrounding it they are all skilled swordsmen and experienced bodyguards each one has his sword upon his thigh to defend his king against an onslaught in the night for king solomon made himself a chariot from the wood of lebanon its posts are silver its canopy gold the seat is purple and the back is inlaid with these words with love Love from the girls of Jerusalem go out and see King Solomon O young women of Zion see the crown with which his mother crowned him on his wedding day his day of gladness now in this passage the Shulamite woman is reminiscing about her wedding day and one author states that the song of Solomon may actually exist in the Bible to affirm God's position God's stance on marriage God ordained the sanctity of marriage from the very beginning when he created Adam and Eve in Genesis 2 24 it says for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and they will become one flesh so important for us to understand God's design because there is so much sexual confusion and chaos in society today we need to understand God's design amen we're not condemning anyone we're not judging anyone we're just saying this is God's will amen and if we've messed up in any way there is grace there is forgiveness when we repent amen so that's what we want to say so another writer states that the purpose of the song of Solomon is to extol the virtues of love between husband and his wife the poem he says clearly presents marriage as God's design a man and woman are to live together within the context of marriage loving each other spiritually emotionally and physically and the physical part comes last if you have the first two in place then that's what will lead to next week's message you will enjoy great sex amen but you got to have the first two in place if the first two are not there you will have a biological function but you won't have great sex amen all right I know it's awful quiet in here but it is okay to talk about sex in church because God created it it's in the Bible amen a whole book in the Bible amen so it's okay to talk about it I remember when I was a young adult pastor I was a youth and young adult pastor I was speaking to the youth a series on on dating and 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 and, and what have you and we were talking about sexual purity and all of this and one of the adults overheard and said I'm gonna tell the pastor you're talking about sex in the youth ministry I said go right ahead because God talked about it in the Bible and the reason our young people are getting in trouble is because we're not talking about it God's way amen well there's nobody for you to complain about right now because I am the pastor so you can't tell the pastor on me amen <laughs> But uh, this is such an important message today in society in which marriage is devalued. Trends indicate that fewer and fewer people are getting married and more people are choosing instead just to live together. Just to live together, even within the church. And there's so many churches today that don't preach the truth. Amen it's a grace message just live any way you want and you can still just you know have a relationship with God but that's not what the Bible teaches amen so today we want to explore God's will for marriage and what biblically constitutes marriage and even if we're not married we need to understand God's plan and purpose for marriage because it is so much more than a couple saying I do and signing a piece of paper 
First of all, which I mentioned earlier, marriage is a covenant of three. Marriage is a covenant of three. Marriage is a divine appointment. I want to look again at verse 6. It says, who is this sweeping in from the deserts like a cloud of smoke along the ground? Now, some Bible scholars say this is actually a symbol or an image of the cloud of God's presence that went with Israel in the desert. Remember how the cloud of God's presence went with them and led them during the day? So some Bible scholars say this is actually a symbol of the cloud of God's presence in a, in a pillar of cloud that led Israel through the wilderness. And it conveys the fact, the language conveys the fact that this couple sensed that God had been working in their lives, bringing them to this point of getting married. Don't get married if you don't have a conviction, this is God's will. If you've not prayed through and gotten that in your spirit, that this person is God's will for my life, then don't get married. Hallelujah. A lot of us, a lot of us, we just, we, we, we just rush to the altar we didn't pray about it. We didn't seek God. And then after we get married, we say, God bless this marriage. God, help me out of this mess. It's the truth. Amen. It's the truth. Because I've stood on this side getting people married. And I've stood on the other side of a desk with people who got married telling me, I don't know how this happened. Well, so, so. Solomon and the Shulamite did not see their wedding just as a legal transaction. They didn't even see it just as a big party to celebrate their love with friends and family. They recognized that marriage was a divine appointment. They understood that their wedding was a holy moment, a sacred occasion on which God was present as the chief witness to their vows. Come on now, folks. We want God to be present from start to finish in our relationship. And we want to understand he is the chief witness to our vows. Amen. So marriage is a divine appointment and marriage is a sacred covenant. Marriage is not a contract between a man and a woman. It is a sacred covenant of three. The man, the woman, and God. When you stand at the altar and say, I do, you are not just pledging to another human being. You are making a commitment to God. And that means that you're going to answer to God for how you live out that commitment to your spouse. You're going to answer for God, to God for how you treat your wife. You're going to answer to God for how you treat your husband. It's gotten awful quiet in here. But that's okay, because, you know, you don't talk much when you're undergoing surgery. Amen? Usually when you're on the surgery table, you are silent, because you're getting cut up inside. Amen? So maybe we're quiet because we're under conviction. Amen? But when you, when you go to that altar and, and you recognize that you are t making this commitment before God, you are also acknowledging your need of God's help to be able to fulfill this vow. Because, folks... The vow you take at marriage is a serious one. And it's difficult to make a relationship work. You need God's help. You need God's help. And so when you, when you come to the altar with that right frame of mind, you say, I'm making this commitment before God, and I'm acknowledging that we need God's help to be able to live it out. Now, when we understand the biblical meaning of marriage, we realize that it's not just a legal contract between two people that can be dissolved by two people. Okay. If it's just a contract between two people, you buy a car, you go to the car dealership, you sign a contract. Okay. It says for the next, nowadays, I don't know how long the car loans are, as expenses are they are. So we'll say for the next 15 years, well, cars are really expensive. It's probably not that long. It's probably seven years. But for the next seven years, I'm going to pay you X number of dollars for the privilege of driving this car. Okay. Now, if you fail to pay it, they can come take your car. Or at some point, you may decide, I want to get rid of this car and get another car. So you go back and you turn it in. You trade it in. So, so the contract can be dissolved either by the dealer that sold you the car, or you can dissolve the contract. Because it's just between two people, right? Yeah. But when you get married, the contract is not just between two people. It's between two people and God. 
And that's why Jesus said in Matthew 19, verses 5 and 6, he says, This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Since they are no longer two, but, let, but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. The pastor didn't join you together. The clerk of the court where you got the marriage license, they didn't join you together. You didn't join you together. God joined you together. And marriage is a lifelong commitment entered into before and with God. Before and with God. Couples sometimes say this. Well, you know, we need to live together first to see if we're compatible to get married. Now, I know some of you shaking your head and saying no. But I've heard that, even among Christian people. One author says, living together is utterly unlike marriage. Utterly unlike marriage in that it lacks the covenant the commitment made before God and man. Because when you're just living together, you know, like Rodney in our opening story, I can get up and leave whenever I want. All right. This author goes on to say, living together doesn't prepare you for marriage at all because it doesn't promote covenant and commitment. It avoids them. In the words of one great theologian, he says, and I mentioned this quote last week, actually, but in the words of one great theologian, he says, why buy the cow if the milk is free? And he's saying marriage does not, uh, living together does not promote commitment. Why buy the cow if the milk is free? So he says, it's no surprise that those who live together before marriage experience a higher rate of divorce than those who do not. In fact, I read a recent survey that said that 80% of relationships in which couples were living together without marriage vows end in separation. The article went on to say that 60% of those married by a justice of the peace are divorced later. 40% of those who are married in churches eventually divorce. But listen to this, because just being in church doesn't guarantee anything. But listen to this. Those who read their Bibles together daily divorce only at the rate of one out of 1,050. That's less than 1%, folks. In fact, I calculated it was 0. 0.0009. So it's a fraction of 1%. Come on now. See, it's not just going to a church and saying, oh, we want to get married in a church because we want God's wife. It's living out a relationship with God every single day. It's praying together. It's reading the word together. It's putting God at the center of your life and your relationship. That's what guarantees a marriage that will endure. Amen. So getting married in a church is not some kind of magic wand that you wave over a relationship. What really guarantees the success of marriage is when both husband and wife have a growing relationship with God. And they are seeking to live for God in all areas of their life, including being the husband or the wife that God is calling them to be. So that means, you know, husbands go through the Bible and find every scripture on what God says a husband should be and start praying, God help me to be that. And wives, you go through the scripture and find everything that the Bible says about what a wife ought to be. Print it out. Start praying it. Lord, help me to be that. Amen? Because you're seeking to honor God and follow God in all areas of your life. That's going to guarantee a marriage that God will bless. Marriage is a covenant between one man and one woman and God. And that requires making God the center of of your life and your relationship with one another, then you will experience the fullness of the blessing that God intends for marriage. Now, secondly, marriage is celebrated in community. I want you to notice Solomon did not go to the wedding alone. He was accompanied by 60 of his mightiest, mightiest men in verse 7. And in verse 11, the bride invites the women of Zion, the women of Jerusalem, to come and witness the wedding celebration. The marriage ceremony is a public testimony, a public testimony of a couple's covenant commitment. 
One writer said, if you just want to make some private vows to each other and you don't want anyone to know that you're married, then you don't love each other nearly enough. Hello. Covenants in biblical times needed to be witnessed. They needed to be witnessed by at least two or three people. Even today, you can't get married without two witnesses. All right. Witnesses are required to sign the wedding certificate and attest to the fact that this couple has legally gotten married. Almost every Christian ceremony begins with the words, Dearly beloved, we are gathered here in the sight of God and in the presence of these witnesses, in the presence of these witnesses, to join this man and this woman together in holy matrimony. See? Marriage takes place in the presence of a community. One writer explains, the reason covenants are public is because its common knowledge blocks anyone from easily breaking the covenant. See, the fact that everybody knows you got married makes it harder for you to break that covenant. He goes on to say, if you pretend to marry, And then five years from now, she leaves and marries another man. What claim have you that she did anything wrong? There would only be your word, and that's not sufficient evidence. So there's a sense of accountability when you make this commitment before family and friends. And it is a testimony of purity as well that says, we are not just living together. Because if everybody doesn't know you got married and you're professing to be a Christian and suddenly they find out you're living together, then they're like, hmm. See? So that's why it's important to have that public witness of your marriage. Because it's a testimony of purity that says we're not just living together, which the Bible calls sin. I know it's not popular to talk about sin nowadays, but let me tell you something. Sin is a serious thing because sin will cut you off from God and it will send you to hell. And if any church does not preach against sin, that is not a true church. Amen. Because they're willing to let you go to hell just so that they can build bigger numbers and preach what's popular. Amen. So living together with somebody apart from marriage, the Bible calls that sin. Don't get mad at me. Get mad at God. All right? We need to honor God in our relationship. And we can't expect his blessing if we're not living his way. Amen? And and, and uh, marriage, when it's witnessed by the community, also sets an example. It sets an example of holiness and righteousness for children to be brought up in a family where their parents have honored God through marriage. Amen. And the marriage ceremony is actually a universal practice. As far back as Genesis 29, we see that Jacob had a ceremony when he married Leah. Of course, we know that his father-in-law pulled a fast one, put a veil over the uglier, older sister, and passed her off onto Jacob. But that's another story for another time. But they actually had a ceremony with the community present to witness. And of course, we know that in the New Testament, Jesus attended the wedding feast of Cana. And so this couple got married among the company or witness of their community, their family, and their friends. As one author states, nearly every culture in the history of humanity has observed some kind of formal wedding ceremony. Why is that? Because from the beginning of time, God laid that foundation. And that's why you find that it has permeated virtually every culture in the world. This writer says, in every culture, there is an event, covenant, vow, or proclamation that is recognized as declaring a man and a woman to be married. In every culture, there is an event, covenant, vow, or proclamation that is recognized as declaring a man and woman to be married. All right. In 1 Corinthians 7, 1 and 2, Paul says, now regarding the questions you asked me in your letter, yes, it is good to abstain from sexual relations, but because there is so much sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. Amen. Amen. So God is saying this is the way to do it. You don't have, uh, you don't have sex outside of marriage. All right. You need to be married. It is sin to have sex outside of marriage and the wedding ceremony matters. Now don't just get married to have sex. 
there was a couple coming here several years ago. And um, he had been attending here much longer than her, but he had uh, come and, and he brought in several, um, several ladies during the course of a couple of years. And you could see that um, even though he was trying to live a Christian, you don't know who he is. It's been many years and he doesn't attend here. So don't try to figure it out, okay? So anyway, um, I would see him walk in on a Sunday morning with a new lady and I would say, there, there we go again. But you could see that he was trying to live a Christian life, but he was very, uh, there was still this uh, stronghold of lust in his life, all right? So finally, um, he brought the, the, this one lady, and she was a Christian. He had met her, and she went to another church and what have you. But she, she came from an abusive relationship in the past and what have you. And um, they were only here for a few weeks, and they came to me about getting married. So I talked to them, and um, I could see that the impetus in this relationship was, I'm trying to be a Christian. I don't want to have sex outside of marriage. So let's hurry up and get married so I can have sex with her. Wow. It wasn't stated in those many words, but when I asked the questions I do in my first premarital counseling session with them, that was the definite feeling that I got. And I told them, I said, you know, guys, you've only known each other a few weeks. And I said, this, this kind of feels rushed to me. I said, and, and uh, from some of the things you said, you know, I, I think the relationship has already started to become a, a, a little physical, um, even though they had not yet apparently gone the whole way. And so I said to them, you know, I think that um, rather than love, I think that physical desire is, is, is propelling this relationship. I said, so what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to take one month, because you both say you're Christians, I want you to take one month away from each other. Don't see each other, don't go out on dates, don't talk to each other. I want you to talk to God. I want you to fast and pray and say, God, is this the one for me? Oh, he looked like I had just killed Bambi in front of his face. He was so upset at me. You know, and I told him, I said, I'm very sorry, but at present, I don't feel like I can perform uh, this, this ceremony. So uh, they left and they didn't heed godly counsel and they went out and rushed and they got married and it wasn't a matter of just a few weeks yeah. when she was coming to me and she was telling me of some things that were going on in the relationship that were quite abusive and um it had because she was from a, an abusive background it had affected her mental health within a few weeks they were separated and tragically shortly thereafter she took her life all because of rushing ahead. Yes, rushing ahead. Patient, Folks, it's serious stuff. Right, Especially when you engage in sex with someone wow. who is ungodly yeah. because you join your soul to them. The Bible warns us against that. Yeah. And it can have very strong ramifications, not just physically, but emotionally and spiritually as well. So that's why we need to follow God's design. Wow. Amen. Folks, I'm talking to you from my heart today because I've seen too much wow. brokenness as a result of this. Yes. So I'm preaching God's word, but I'm doing it from my heart because I love you, I care about you, and I want God's best for you. Amen? So marriage is, is witnessed by the community, but marriage is also contractually sealed. Contractually sealed. The covenant of marriage needs to be recognized by civil authority. Through the years, I've actually had people come to me and say, Pastor, we don't want to get married legally for financial reasons. But can you just do a ceremony for us privately? <laughs> Hello? What? Wow. And bless fornication? Wow. No. You need, to, you need to have that witnessed and you need to have it legally recognized oh, yeah. by civil authority. You see, the Hebrew word for covenant not only speaks of a sacred vow, but it speaks of a binding contract that is a formal legal agreement. You hear me? Yeah. The Hebrew word for covenant doesn't just speak of making vows, but it speaks of a formal legal agreement. As one author states, from ancient Bible times, cultural procedures and dowry traditions were fulfilled to legally recognize a marriage. 
You know, I, I'll be honest with you, you know, there are different cultures that have different practices. And several years ago, we had an individual that was taking membership and I was teaching certain things about the purity that's required to be a church member and the change of life and stuff. And, and so they came to me after the class and they said, Pastor, do me and my husband need to get married again? Because they were from another culture and they said, we didn't have a church wedding. We had a cultural wedding. And I wasn't really sure what a cultural wedding was. So I had to uh, consult, I call him one of my cultural translators in the church because he was from that same culture, but he's been a longtime member and leader in our church. So I went to him and I said, brother, I said, there is a situation where someone mentioned to me a cultural marriage from your country. Is that a legal marriage? <laughs> And so he said, oh, yes, yes, it's illegal. I said, okay, thank God. <laughs> you know, So I had to have a cultural translator help me to understand whether it was legal or not. You know, But um, it does need to be legally recognized. The provision for a certificate of divorce, a legal writing of divorce, goes all the way back to Deuteronomy 24.1. And that reveals that some type of formal legal marriage covenant must have existed all the way back then in order to warrant a legal writ of divorce. You understand me? All right. I read one article that stated that archaeologists have discovered a 4,000-year-old baked clay tablet that outlines the marital agreement between a man and a woman named Laquipam and Hatala. They weren't particularly Jewish. I don't know what their, back, what their cultural background was, but you can see by the commitment that they made, it was not a biblical commitment. But it, one of the provisions of the covenant says that if the couple failed to conceive a child within two years, the husband could enlist the help of a surrogate. Wow. But they had it written out. It was a legal agreement, all right? Now, I'm not saying it was biblical. I'm just saying as long as 4,000 years ago, they had legal marriage licenses or covenants, all right? The Mishnah, which contains the record of ancient Jewish rabbinic teachings, contains an entire section called Ketubot, Ketubot, which speaks of contracts, and it includes numerous rules and regulations regarding marriage contracts. So this is ancient rabbinic Jewish teaching going back thousands of years ago, and they're talking about the, the regulations for marriage contracts. In fact, in an article titled, What is the Biblical Definition of Marriage? It speaks of the traditional Jewish wedding ceremony and the ketubah, or marriage contract, which is read in the original Aramaic language. The husband accepts certain marital responsibilities, such as providing food, shelter, and clothing for his wife, and he promises to care for her emotional needs as well. This is part of that Jewish mission of the Ketubah. And this contract is so important that the marriage ceremony is not complete until the groom signs it and presents it to the bride. And this demonstrates that both husband and wife see marriage as more than just a physical and emotional union, but also as a moral and legal commitment to one another. So from ancient biblical times going back thousands of years, marriage was more than just a couple saying vows to one another, but it also involved a legal contract. Okay, so folks, it's not enough to, oh, we got on our patio, and we had some friends, and we just shared our vows with one another. No, there's got to be a legal confirmation of that relationship. Marriage needs to be legally recognized. In fact, in Romans 13 and 1 Peter 2, 17, the Bible calls believers to obey and submit to government authorities and its requirements as long as it does not violate God's word. And certainly, getting a marriage license from our government authority does not violate God's word. It actually honors what God teaches. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. So God, this is going to blow your, 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 your bubble. God does not recognize common law marriage. Now, I know legally, after a couple lives together for seven years, the government says, what's your property is their property and what have you. Go ahead, Pastor. Okay. But God doesn't honor that. That's right. That's There's got to be a written contract. And God calls it sin for a couple to engage in any sexual activity outside of marriage that has not been co uh, consecrated by a covenant agreement entered into between one man and one woman before God 
and the witnesses of their community of family and friends and the recognition of the laws of the land. One Christian speaker named Lakita Garth addressing this popular misconception that marriage is just a piece of paper asked someone in the audience to take out a $1 bill. She said, look at the color of the ink, feel the smell of the paper, look at the shape and the size, and read the year that it was minted and the words printed on top, in God we trust. She asked the volunteer if the piece of paper has any value. And generally, the person will say, yes. Then Lakita takes out a $20 bill and she asks, what does it look like? What does it smell like? What does it feel like? The response is generally the same as a $1 bill. Then she asks, if you had to choose your $1 bill or my $20 bill, which would you choose? And she said, the answer is always the $20 bill. So Lakita asks, why? And they respond, because it's worth more. It has a higher value. And then Lakita makes her point. So then one piece of paper does have greater value than another because of what is printed on it. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. She goes on to say, my marriage license, though printed on a piece of paper, has value because it defines my relationship with the man I sleep with every night. She said, I am not his baby mama. I hate that term, folks. That is, to me, such a loose, ungodly term. Come on now. She said, I am not his baby mama. I'm not his old woman. I'm not his girlfriend. I'm not his friend with benefits or his significant other. I am his wife. This paper says we are legal, we are legitimate, and we have been united as one. Hallelujah. That piece of paper matters, and God cares about your wedding. Marriage is so much more than a piece of paper. The best reasons for couples to get married is because God's word says so. And we can only experience God's blessings when we follow God's way of doing things. If you're currently feeling uncomfortable with this message, praise God. Because if you're not living God's way and you're sexually involved with someone that you're not married with, that discomfort that you're feeling is good. It means that you have not so hardened your heart that you cannot feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Because that discomfort is the Holy Spirit convicting you and saying, you need to get right. You need to get right. I'm not condemning you. I love you. I'm not judging you. There is grace for you and there is forgiveness for you. And it's not too late to make a U-turn. That's what repentance is all about. Amen. But the fact that you're feeling uncomfortable, that's God getting your attention. If you're a Christian and you're not married and you're sexually involved, God is saying, repent of your sin and stop Sinning. Remember the woman caught in the sin of adultery that was brought to Jesus. He said, neither do I condemn you, but he didn't stop there. Because a lot of people today, that's where they stop with their preaching. Grace, grace, grace. He said, neither do I condemn you. But then he said, go and sin no more. So you know what? God allows U-turns. If you've messed up, if you've been having sex with somebody, living together with somebody, well, God allows U-turns. It's called repentance. But repentance is not only asking forgiveness, but it's also going and sinning no more. So that might be painful. It might mean that you may have to break off a relationship. Well, what did Jesus say? It's better to enter into heaven you know, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Because it's better to enter into heaven missing a hand or missing an eye than to lose your soul. So it's, you may have to cut off a relationship and it may be painful. But it's better to enter into heaven than to hold on to that person and lose your soul. And lose your soul. And somebody might be saying there, 
Pastor, that, that, that's hard preaching. I don't want to, I don't want to lose him or, or I don't want to lose her. You should be more concerned about losing your relationship with God. Amen. And let me tell you something. If that person is the right person for you and is truly in love with you. And if you're a Christian and they're a Christian, then they should be concerned about their soul as well. And understand why you are cutting it off until such time that you get the confirmation that they may be the one God wants you to marry. And then you make it right. And if you're a Christian and they're not a Christian, I can tell you right now, it is not God's will for you to be together with them. Because the Bible says, be not unequally yoked with an unbeliever. So the relationship may be sexually sinful, but I can tell you that it is spiritually wrong as well. I want to encourage every Christian, young and old, to commit to seek God's best for your life. And seeking God's best for your life means living God's way. You've been doing it your way, and now it's time to say, not my way, but your way, God. And start by committing to attend this series, every message. Amen? So God can train you from his word how to do it his way. And if you've never given your heart to Christ, it doesn't matter how bad you've messed up. It doesn't matter if you're, uh, how bad you have sinned. God will forgive you if you repent and place your faith in him. You see, we've all sinned, and yeah. sin cuts us off from God. Sin makes us spiritually dead, and God is spirit. So if we're spiritually dead, we can't have a relationship with him. And that's the whole reason that Jesus came to earth, lived a sinless life, and gave his life for us. So that now when we place our faith in him as our savior and we repent of our sins and the word repent simply means to turn around. It means to make a U-turn. It means I recognize I've been heading in the wrong direction. I've been doing things my way without regard for God. I recognize I'm headed towards destruction. I don't want to live that way anymore. And I turn around and say, God, I repent. I confess that I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. And I invite you to come live inside of me and help me from this day forward. To live for you. And the moment we do that, the, Jesus said we're born again. We're made spiritually alive and we're brought into relationship with God as his son or his daughter. And that's the beginning, not the end, the beginning of a wonderful lifelong relationship with him where we learn how to love and live for him. Amen. So if you have never given your heart to Christ, you may be listening online and you've never given your heart to Christ, or maybe you did some time ago and you've drifted away and you can feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You can feel God tugging at your heart saying it's time to come back. If that's you, I want to encourage you to pray with me right now. Not that my words are special. I just want to help you to know how to pray. Would you say this prayer with me? Dear Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God and I believe that you love me so much that you died for my sins. Today, I confess that I'm a sinner. I repent. I turn away from my sin and I turn to you in faith. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins and I invite you to come live inside of me. Help me from this day forward to live for you in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, I want to congratulate you on making the best decision of your life and welcome you to the family of God. Amen. And I want to encourage you right now, if you're in-house and you just prayed that prayer, if we could put the uh, phone number up on the screen, uh, there's going to be a phone number pop up on your screen in just a moment in-house. And if you will text, I prayed to that number. Why? Because we want to send you free of charge a little booklet that will help you to understand the prayer you just prayed and, and give you some simple steps to continue growing in your relationship with the Lord. Because as we said, that prayer was just the beginning not the end. If you're online and you prayed that prayer, please just type, I prayed in the comments 
and a little bit later today, we're gonna send you a response message with a link. Click that link, fill in your name and email address so that we can email you free of charge this little booklet. So if you would do that right now, text I prayed to the number on the screen or type I prayed and look for a message a little bit later today. Click on the link, fill in your name and your email address so that we can send you this book free of charge. And in the meantime, I wanna encourage all that just prayed and every believer to do three things that will help us grow in our relationship with God every day. One is talk to God. He is your heavenly father. He wants to hear from you. He wants to converse with you. And so we encourage you to talk to God every single day. That's what the Bible calls prayer. Start by thanking him for the good things in your life because every good thing comes from him. Life, strength, health, family, friends, a job, food, what every good thing comes from him. Thank him every day for his blessings. And then Talk to him about whatever you're facing, decisions you're making, problems you're facing, uh, temptations you're struggling with, and ask his help. Talk to him every day at a very basic level. That's what prayer is. Secondly, let God talk to you every day. You say, how does God talk to me, Pastor? The number one way God talks to us is through the Bible. That's his message to us. And if you don't have a printed Bible, I encourage you to download the YouVersion app for free on your phone or tablet. You can read the Bible there as much as you want. There's never a charge. And I encourage you to start reading in 1 John. It's a small little book in the New Testament. It tells us who Jesus is and what he's done for us to help you understand what just happened to you when you prayed. Before you read, just pray, God, help me to understand what I'm reading and apply it to my life. And then just read a few verses, four or five verses for the day. Whatever stands out to you, whatever speaks to you at that moment, just pray, God, help me to put this in practice in my life. Do that every day. And then the third thing is find a local assembly of God church. If you're here in South Florida, then of course, we invite you to be a part of our new life church family. We have a wonderful church family that will pray for you, encourage you, support you, and walk alongside of you. If you're outside of the South Florida area, find a local assembly of God church near to you and start putting down roots in that church. Don't just attend. Church is so much more than just attending a service. It's about the relationships we build with one another. That's what encourages us and strengthens us and helps us to continue on in the journey. So get connected to a local assembly of God church. And of course, if you're here in South Florida, we invite you to New Life Assembly. If you do those three things, then it will ensure that you will have a strong and growing relationship with the Lord. So I encourage every believer to do those three things regularly. Once again, congratulations. I want to speak finally to those that are already Christians. Let's commit to live sexually pure lives, even in our thoughts. Because Jesus said, if you think it in your mind to to lust after a woman, you've already committed adultery, right? So sexually pure lives, even in our thoughts. And let's commit to live by the value of God's word, not the values of the world. Doesn't matter what everybody else is doing. What matters is what God says in his word. If you're not married and you've been sexually involved, it's time to make a decision. You can't have God and keep sinning. So it's time to make a decision to do things God's way. Don't stay in a relationship and settle for less than what God has for you and jeopardize your soul. Let's make a commitment to live God's way. Would you just bow your head right where you are? Every believer, let's commit to live by God's word, by his way, to commit to sexual purity, And for those that may be in a sexually impure situation, pray that God will give you the strength to separate yourself from that sinful situation. Everyone praying from your heart right now. Heavenly Father, we just come before you right now and we humble ourselves before your word. Father, Jesus said many times, he who has ears, let him hear. He was talking about people who had an open heart. Let them receive the truth. Father, let us have an open heart to receive your truth today. Let us not harden your heart because of what our flesh wants. But let us open our heart because of what your spirit wants. Father, we ask you right now that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would work in our hearts and our lives. As we bow before you this morning, we commit ourselves to live sexually pure lives. 
to live our lives according to the values of your word and not the values of this world. It doesn't matter what everyone else is doing because, Lord, you said that the way that leads to destruction is wide and easy and many are on that road. But you said that the way that leads to life is narrow and it's hard and there are few that find it. Lord, help us to be the few that are willing to find it and walk it out. Let us live according to your way, not our way. And Father, I pray for those that may be presently involved in a sexually immoral relationship. That even as your Holy Spirit is dealing with their heart right now, that they would not harden their heart against you. But that they would allow you to work in them and give them the strength to separate themselves from that sinful situation. Father, I place them in your hands and I ask you to do this work. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Thank you for joining us today. If you are blessed by this message, would you consider giving a gift to help support our ministry? You can text any amount to 954-516-1522. Thank you so much, and we hope you will join us again. God bless you.